reports only, you only have to report on the aspects that you're using. So if you're using Django right now, you're probably, it's probably like less than 10 lines of code right now. It says serve static files in this directory. It's pretty much all you need right now. Um, so go to the code in Django that serves static files, that gets a request, parses that request, extracts the file name, opens that file, and then sends that as the response. Find that code in Django, and then give me the link to that, uh, to that file. And I explain how it does that in uh, all the requirements of the report based on that. Um, yeah, because if, if, if you had to report on everything Django does, that'd be crazy. That'd be uh, a bit of a search. And then for the next, uh, uh, the next phases, phase two, you're going to use a lot more Django features. For each feature that you use, add that to the report. Add some more links. Here's where we're doing routing. Here's where, uh, here's where we're uh, linking the template engine to the server. Uh, and, and add each of those. And add each of those through to the Django report. So just one report for each technology, but you'll expand that report as you use more features. Yeah. As a general rule, yeah, sorry. Can you say a link to the code and then click on line to source? Mm -hmm. A link. So if possible, the ideal situation, link to the GitHub, um, the code on GitHub. So if, for example, GitHub uh, Django, so you go through Django, let's see if I can do this one quick, Django, request, that's not going to be it. But of course, that, that's all your request response code. Uh, that'll be good stuff that you'll need later. But where's, uh, where would they put static hosting? Probably middleware. I already clicked that one. Damn it, Jesse. Uh, let's go down this hole a little bit. So I'm curious, and I want to go through. I want to go through an example of this last week. Never got to it. Um, but how exactly to do this? I did the one example, but it was all pre-canned. I I prepared it all before lecture, so it wasn't as helpful as it could have been. Um, but let me go through the process of actually going through this. I, you know, I like the sunlight. I like that window open, but. Really hard to see the projector with that. Uh, there's not a whole lot I'm gonna do about that. Oh my god, pie chart. <laughs> it's going to be hard enough without pie charm fighting me. ever wonder why I use light modes, just so it shows up better on the projector. PyCharm I don't usually show in lectures. <clears throat> so here's a, a site that I have using Django, so let's check out, ooh, I haven't looked at this in a while. Uh, but let's check out how this does. It's, uh, it's static hosting. URLs, views, no, context processor, no, that's mine, apps, app config, oh boy, this might have been a mistake, uh, that's my code, I might have to bail and do routing, oh no, here we go. Deployed settings. Don't look at my secret. Uh, oh my god, it uses. All right, we can we can do this. I'm getting close. Find usage. I just forget how 
uh, oops. I just forget where in this code. I haven't opened this project in a while, so I forget where in this code I even set the static. Um, I'm starting to wonder if I'm even using static files here. You know what? I'm not because I'm I'm deferring to the server. Oh damn it! <laughs> All right, we're gonna we'll bail on that one and look at routing. Because uh, I'm not even using Django static files over here. Uh, I'm just using templates, and then my static files are are hosted on a, a separate server. Damn it. Uh, so let's go to my routing, which is in the URLs. Import Django. URLs, Django comps, URLs, import URL. So let's take that to conf URLs. Oh, we actually stumbled upon the static stuff. Okay. <laughs> this was not the best. But this is how it's going to go when you look through it. So this is realistic. You're going to be poking around in the code trying to find out where that, uh, that stuff goes. So if I'm Serving static files, I'm going to call this static method, give it my directory, and uh, it's going to add that to my path. So it looks like this has to be called somewhere else, which is going to be where this is used. Oh, yeah, because I'm in the comp. Um, this was a mistake. URLs. This looks like the code that does the routing. So somewhere in here there should be static method, not what I want. Somewhere in here there's got to be how to route to static files. Noodles? I'm going to have to bail on this one. Um, so we found the routing but and uh, part of the static hosting code. Uh, but I didn't get the, the full thing. But this is what you do. Go through the code. Uh, open source, by definition, means you have the source available online. It's usually on GitHub. That's the industry standard. Everything's out there on GitHub. Uh, mostly, you might find some projects that are not on GitHub. They'll be hosted somewhere else. Uh, and if you use code that you don't have access to the source. Uh, as those cases come up, <coughs> oh, sorry, uh, link to some documentation, link to whatever you do have access to, to be able to get uh, get some information out there. Um, linking to documentation for the API would be helpful in that case. Um, and if it is closed source, you're probably going to be more concerned about the licenses in that part of the report. What does this imply? If I'm using this code that is not open source, but is available for me to use, there's probably going to be some conditions and strings attached to that. Uh, so make sure you're really focusing on that aspect of it if you don't have access to the source. That's a good indicator that you're using something that um, <clears throat> uh, that you're using something that's going to have some strings attached to it. Now I'm wondering why don't I have, oh, I know why. I 
I feel like we danced all around that. Uh, I gotta give this one more shot. Uh, the conf in the URLs, this doesn't have a mention of the word static. I think that's because, all right, I'm starting to piece this together. So the, the router is going to use the reg axis to be able to figure out how to path. And then that, uh, and the conf, the static files thing in here, returned a reg X. So that was added to the path. So if I want to add static, uh, static directory, I would call this method. That's going to return a reg X, which I would then add to my router. The router doesn't care that that's ho that reg X is hosting static files. It's just going to uh, use this routing to be able to figure it out. What I don't see yet is where it's actually opening the static file, reading the static file, and then adding that to the response. And that's the part that's really bugging me right now. What's the view? That's where I would look for, but all right, I got to call that. I would we're not going to get all the way there. Uh, but you get the idea. You're going to root around in the code and find that, uh, figure out where exactly it is. And then ideally, a GitHub link, give me that URL to that actual code. All right, any other questions before we, uh, before we go into it? Uh, master Django view static. Was I in the wrong directory? Bless you. Oh, because I, I leapt right into. Django, Django, fused. Yeah, here we go. There it is. Thank you, Michaela B with the save. Uh, so here, here it is. Here's where we're actually getting the, uh, getting the actual file out of that, reading that file, opening it in binary mode, reading the bytes of the file, uh, adding that to the response. reading the content length, or sorry, reading the content type, I'm looking for length. Uh, apparently length sent, uh, set somewhere else in the code, uh, but reading the content type from that file type, uh, setting those headers, this is where the action's happening. Twitch chat with the save, thank you. Which is why we, we usually pre-prepare those things. Uh, doing that live, it's going to be messy like that. But that's how it's going to go when you look it up. So uh, I want to do at least one of those that wasn't pre-prepared for lecture. All right, let's talk about some web sockets. Uh, so last time, last time when we talked about web sockets on Monday, we talked about establishing a connection. We talked about getting this random web socket key, appending this unique uh, a string, this uh, uh, globally unique ID as it is, uh, but appending that to the end of the key, taking the SHA-1 hash of that, encoding that using base64, bless you, and sending that back uh, to the client to be able to verify that we have a WebSocket connection, that we're both speaking the protocol, and we're avoiding hashing, uh, sorry, not hashing, caching. We're avoiding caching by using hashing, and uh, we can get this connection. Once we have the connection, then what do we do? That's what we want to talk about today. So we're going to get messages. We call them frames in, uh, in the web world of WebSockets. Uh, but one message can consist of multiple frames, similar to C TCP, where we're going to have multiple IP packets that are stitched together uh, to form an entire message. So we call them frames, but in our cases, for our purposes in this class, we'll assume, which will be correct in our homeworks, that 
every frame is going to contain an entire message. So I may use those synonymously. We're not going to have a single message spanning multiple frames. Um, but we will still stick with the terminology frame. Unless I slip up, I might accidentally say message. So we're going to get data in this format. Uh, and we'll parse through all of this and see what each one of these, uh, what all this means. Uh, on the top level, this is what each bit means when we get a binary frame from our WebSocket or from our TCP socket that we're using for WebSockets. This, all this does is specify the order in which the bits arrive. And I want to take just a little bit of time to talk about that. The, this is, uh, I think, one of the biggest things that dispels the myth that the internet is magical. Uh, so if you want to still believe the internet's magic, this is the one thing, at least for me, that really squashed that. And I realized that it's just, it's just not magical at all. Um, the internet is, more than most things, a bundle of protocols. It's a bundle of wires, uh, cables and fiber, and a little bit of wireless connecting everything. And then to actually use those wires, it's a bundle of protocols that we use to be able to make sense of that, those connections. So on the wires and on the fiber and in the Wi-Fi, we only have ones and zeros. That's all we can do is just send ones and zeros back and forth through the air, over the wires, uh, as light in the fiber. However, we're transmitting our data, it's always, always, always ones and zeros. And you've probably heard that quite a bit. Uh, especially if you're in computer engineering or you're taking some EE classes, you're, you're aware of the ones and zeros, but it's not always apparent to us. We have many layers of abstraction between us and the ones and zeros in most cases. Um, but this is how the internet works. It's making sense of those ones and zeros through protocols. So two of those protocols, you heard of TCP IP, we talked about it briefly earlier. If you take modern networking concepts, you'll talk about these in uh, in much more depth. Uh, but here, this is most of the definition of IP and TCP. Most of what those protocols define is, uh, is the order of those ones and zeros and the meaning of those ones and zeros. So when I send a bunch of ones and zeros to a router, how does that router know what to do with those ones and zeros? Well, it knows that the first four ones and zeros are going to indicate the version of IP that I'm using. The next ones and zeros are this IHL, and I don't remember what all these are, uh, but it's just going to look at the bits in this exact order under the assumption that I'm speaking IP. I'm working under the assumption that the router is programmed to speak IP, that some other developer looked at this same image from the same RFC and implemented their code in the same exact way. And then I'm going to assemble my bits in that same exact way. And then as long as we both write our code following this protocol, we're able to communicate with each other. Same with TCP. TCP is going to specify the order of the bits. So what bits represent all this information, well, the source port, that's going to be in the first two bytes of information that I send. The first eight bits that are sent in the TCP header, which is going to be inside the IP header. So first thing, IP header, the routers read these. Once that packet gets to its destination, the IP headers are removed or ignored, and uh, the application is going to read, or the OS is going to read the TCP header and figure out which process this packet is for. It's going to assemble, uh, it's going to rearrange all the sequence numbers, all the packets, individual packets into a message, read that, those port numbers, and send that to the TCP connection on that specific port and get that information. And at that point, we start implementing uh, HTTP. We're speaking HTTP. We assume the client is speaking HTTP. We follow the right protocol. All we're doing is making sense of the ones and zeros by specifying a very specific order and number of bits for important pieces of information. And one of those, uh, and usually one of those big important, <laughs> I, should, I should never, I gotta stop digging myself self in holes like that. 
there it is, uh, is always, just like we're reading content length to figure out the length of a post request, the length is always important. So we're, we want to have the total length in our packets so we know when the next packet is going to start. So the next bit after I read total length, I'm gonna read all these headers, read total length, and then read that many bytes after the headers, and then I know that next bit on the wire or on the fiber is going to be the start of the version of the next packet. With, I'm sure, I, I'm not too familiar with how the, the routers are coded, but I'm sure there's some uh, fault tolerance there to make sure some uh, end of packet bits, I don't know what exactly they do, but probably some way to make sure that if somebody sends an improper total link, they'll have to be able to handle that at some point as well. Uh, I don't know specifically what they do, um, but the protocols are going to help us make sense of all those ones and zeros. And that's all the internet is, ones and zeros flying all over the place with stacks of protocols, uh, IP for routing, TCP for reliability, HTTP uh, for everything we're doing in this course, and then WebSockets, which, uh, which we're seeing, is uh, similar to HTTP in that it's going to work after the TCP layer. It's in the application layer, as we say, uh, to be able to get different features and different functionality. So with WebSockets, let's make sense of these ones and zeros. So now we're on this end. We're not going to do TCP and IP in this course. It's outside of the, the scope of this course. But we will do WebSockets, which uses the same idea. We specify, the protocol specifies the order of the bits. And then when we get bits from the client, we're going to assume that the, the programmers, the developers that wrote our browser read this same RFC, and they're following the same spec, and they wrote their code to be able to put bits in this exact order following this exact protocol, and I sure hope they are. I, I mean, all the major browsers, of course, they are. They're properly implementing this protocol. So when we get our messages, when we're testing our apps, we just like with HTTP, we assumed our browser was gonna set the right headers that we need. That they're going to set the content length properly, the content type properly. They're going to have the request line uh, in the proper format so we can parse on those things. We know that the, uh, the line after the headers is going to be a blank line, so we can look for that slash r slash n slash r slash n as part of the protocol. Uh, and all the major browsers are properly following that protocol. Their developers properly implemented that protocol. So we can rely on it. We can look for that blank line, know that that's the end of the headers. We're just organizing our information using a common, uh, a common standard. So same thing here. We're going to assume the browsers, the developers of each browser read this RFC and followed it to a T so we can parse these messages. So when we get a WebSocket frame, we're going to assume that it's in this format. The assumption should always be true. If it's not, I mean, that's on the browser. Um, in, uh, in most cases, I guess you could really, there's probably a way you could screw it up, but let's not, <laughs> let's just not. Um, so let's take a look at this. So we're already reading these frames as bytes. You get these frames just like you would, uh, just like you would the, uh, from reading the HTTP requests, you're gonna call receive, you're gonna sit there on receive until there's some information to be read, and after we did the protocol upgrade, that information is going to be a WebSocket frame. So next time receive returns, that means we just got a frame on that TCP socket, which is a WebSocket frame. So when we call receive, whatever language you're using, uh, I think JavaScript gets a little spotty with this. It wants to do some conversions for you. Um, but you're getting this information as bytes, uh, and we wanna read those bytes at the bit level this time. So let's talk a little bit about bits. Um, this is something you have to draw on some knowledge from other CS courses, which is actually nice and I'm excited about. Uh, if you've taken 341, you're really aware of this stuff. If you're computer engineering, you're probably really aware of this as well. If not, you'll have to draw back from 191 where you've seen some bit level logic and bitwise operators. Uh, with 
to read it bits from a byte, we have to remember that bytes are int values and that int values are represented as binary uh, under the hood. This is something that's always true. Our, our integers are binary, uh, represented in binary, but we usually don't have to think about that. These days, we really don't uh, have to talk about that too much. We don't have to be too aware of it. But when we're talking about this, we really want to be aware of the bits that we're using. And this uh, handy tool that you might not have used in a programming language yet, but you've seen in 191, a bitwise hand uh, to be able to uh, uh, to be able to mask what we call mask the bits. So if I take this mask 15, so for example, I want to read the opcode right here. This, if I read the first byte of my byte array, I'm going to get this information right here, the first eight bits of this frame. So if I say receive, I got some data, and I uh, put that in some variable named data, and I say data of zero, I get that first byte. I have a byte array, uh, and I want to get that first byte. So I pull out that first byte. That's going to contain my fin bit, my three reserve bits, and my opcode. If I only want the opcode, I'm going to take my logical and 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 that with the number 15. So that byte is going to be an integer value, uh, an 8-bit integer value. I want to and that with 15, which is 1111 in binary. And then no matter what these bits were, they're going to be zeroed out with the and operator operation. This is a bitwise and. So if I and that with 15, I'm only going to get the opcode out of that. And I have some integer from 0 to 15 representing the opcode only. So if I want to extract a single value, I want to use my logical and, or my bitwise and, not logical and, I think I said logical and earlier, didn't I? Uh, bitwise and, a single ampersand. If you ever wondered why logical and is ampersand ampersand, because single ampersand is reserved for bitwise and. A bitwise and with a bit mask that's appropriate for whatever I'm trying to extract. So for example, if I'm trying to extract this mask bit, I would take the second byte and and that with 128. 128 is going to be one and then seven zeros. So I'm going to zero out this whole payload length, these seven bits. I'm going to get only the mask. If that return value is 128, I know my mask is one. If it's zero, I know my mask was zero. The order, I mean, it's just what the protocol decided. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's a, a specific uh, good answer that I could give you. Uh, the order, I mean, the order just has to be decided. What would you want it to be the first bit? I'm sure we could argue back and forth, and I'm sure the developers, the engineers here, did argue back and forth of what should be the first bit. Should the first bit be the mask? I don't know. Um, Maybe, well, the next slide we're actually going to talk, we're going to go through these things one at a time. Um, the finish bit doesn't mean this is the end. It means this is the, let me just click. It means that this is the last frame for this message. So if the finish bit is one, this is the last frame of this message. And for, for our purposes, we're going to assume this is always one. If you don't want to write the code to check the finish bit specifically, we're going to be doing enough bitwise stuff here. Um, you can just assume that's going to be one. We're going to get the entire message in a single frame. If that's zero, it means there's going to be more frames coming that are part of that same message. All those frames have to be buffered, spliced together, and then read. And we already had our fill of buffering. Let's not. Let's just not. So, uh, but that, that could be a thing. And that's used if the client doesn't know the size of the message but wants to start sending data. If it has something, whatever it's doing, where it just doesn't know how much data it's going to send, but it doesn't want to wait for all the data to come in before it starts sending, maybe the client wants, the server wants to start processing earlier, uh, that's when you would use a finish bit of zero. This is the only time you do something like that. Frames are always 6 by 32, like this? Uh, no. Uh, the, this payload can be 
you go. They seem to be what was that pretty much our brain. That's still part of the system. That's still part of the same brain. Yes. Uh, so let's go through these and, and talk about the rest because I think it'll answer some of your questions here. Uh, these reserve bits, reserve if you're using any extensions to the protocol, if you're adding to the WebSocket protocol, and the client and server agree on what uh, what those extensions are, and they'll agree with those through uh, separate headers. We're not going to use these. We're going to assume these are all zero. We're not going to use the reserve bits. Vanilla web frames, that's going to be enough, uh, enough for us. Next, the app code. Four bits representing what this frame is. There are certain app codes that are used. We're going to assume one for the homework text. If it's binary, so if you want to send an image through a web socket and you want to specify that that's binary information, you would send a two here. Uh, whenever the client closes the connection, you'll, so you actually see these ones, you'll get the an, an eight. Why did I? <laughs> That's uh, un unfortunate typing on my part. It's binary. Uh, so two for, for binary, eight for close the connection. And, and this is the ping pong that we saw uh, briefly in the Twitch chat. Uh, that would also be in here in A and B, I believe. So uh, uh, 10 and 11. Uh, would uh, would be the ping and pong. And there are a few other ones. We're going to only use text, and we're going to assume that everything we get is some text, some textual information. So we can build the equivalent of a, a chat service. Uh, the ping and pong are used to make sure the server will send that to each client to see if the client is still alive, if it's still out there, uh, so it can check. If you don't get a pong back in a reasonable amount of time, close that connection, you don't have to waste any processing power keeping that connection open anymore. Uh, that's if, uh, if the client severs the connection without sending that close bit, kind of came up last time uh, in lecture, that's one way that you could handle that if you don't get the close opcode, uh, but the client did disconnect, that's one way you would be able to detect that. Send a ping, you don't get a pong, that connection's closed. The mask bit is either going to be one if a mask is used, zero if a mask is not used. Uh, I didn't put the assumption on here, but I put it on the homework. Oh, the, the homework doc is up. <laughs> I forgot to, forgot to mention that one. Uh, the, the next homework doc is up. Uh, it's mostly, like I, as promised, it's basically homework five, but with web sockets and parsing through all this bit stuff. It will be a, another jump up. It won't be like homework four, but it'll be definitely harder than homework five. Homework five is pretty, fairly straightforward. Uh, I think, and uh, but doing that same functionality with WebSockets, there are a few few things in there that are going to take a little bit of work. So just a heads up on that. Uh, so the mask bit for the homework, you can assume that this is. Oh, I did write it right here. What am I saying? Uh, you can assume this is one from the client. This is this should always be one. I would not expect any client to ever send a frame without a mask, uh, so this will always be one when you're receiving messages. When you're sending response frames to, or not necessarily response frames, but when you're sending frames to the client, you don't have to set this mask bit. You can have it zero and then have no mask. Again, we use the mask for caching purposes, so these frames are looking different, even if the client keeps sending the same information. We want it to look different each time, just to trick our, uh, any aggressive cacher so it's not caching the responses it's sending them back because we need those frames on the socket. Uh, if there's a chat app, we want to know those messages. We don't just care that the, serve, the client got some response back because we're not even sending responses with WebSockets. This is not a request response protocol. This is two-way communication, it's full duplex communication. There's, caching just doesn't make sense with this protocol. So to trick the, any caching, the client's going to set this mask bit to one and then have a random mask here, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. Before we talk about masking proper, we gotta have a fairly long conversation about length. The frame length of 
frame length. This is similar to the content length. Is some information that we just always have to have in these protocols, just in case we read, we receive from our TCP socket, and that receive does not contain the entire frame. Again, for your homework, you can assume that we're going to get the entire frame in one call to receive on the socket. So again, no buffering for this. We had our buffering fun, and I want you to focus on the bits, specifically the length and the mass. Those are the ones we're going to focus on. For everything that we covered so far, I said you can assume that these are whatever, so we don't really have to think about those too much. Length and the mass, these ones we do have to think about. This is where a lot of the work's going to come in in the homework assignment. Oh, I was. Yes, I figured out how to do that. Um, uh, so let's talk about the length. So the length is going to be represented in either a 7-bit value, a 16-bit value, or a 64-bit value, depending on what the total length is. So we have some options here. Not all of these bits are going to be used for the length on every frame. Uh, and we have to read this length to be able to tell what that's going to be. So when we read the length, or rather, uh, if the length is less than 126 bytes, then the length itself is going to be represented in seven bits. So with seven bits, we can represent numbers up to 127. So we have to do something if the payload is greater than 127. And this is how the protocol handles that to be able to expand the number of bits used for the length. It's uh, a little bit of efficiency. We don't always want to use a lot of bits for the length, or rather the, the developers of this protocol. That's what they decided. So if the length is less than 126 bytes, the payload length is seven bits. You would apply your mass, your uh, bit mass of 127 to the, get these seven bytes, pull out that mass bit, Get this length, and if that's less than 126, that's going to be the entire payload length. And then the next bit is going to be the start of your mask. None of these bits will be used for payload length. The very next bit will be the start of your mask if the length is less than 126. So you read those seven bits. If that length is less than 126, you know that that's your payload length, and the next is going to be the start of your mask. If no mask was used, which we don't have to worry about on the parsing side, if there was no mask, if this bit was zero, your very next bit would be the start of your actual payload, which is the message that you're reading. So if mask is zero and payload's less than 126, next bit would be your payload data. If the payload length is between 126 and 65, 536, less than, not inclusive, then that seven bit payload length will be exactly 126. If you read a 126, that's your indicator that the payload length is going to be represented in the next 16 bits. So if you read this seven bit payload length, which you're always going to read this, this will always be there. If this is exactly 126, then the payload length is going to be the next 16 bits of the frame, and then your mask would start on the next bit. If the payload length is exactly 127, that means we were greater than 65,000 bytes, and the payload length is going to be represented as 64 bits. All of this is going to be payload length uh, the, representing the number of bytes of the payload. And then after that, it would be the masking key. Uh, and the payload length can be up to 16 exabytes. So this is why we're really not worried about that thin bit. That thin bit's always going to be one if all the data is available right away because these frames can be up to 16 exabytes. I don't think we're going to... Uh, run up against that. We're going to have other issues before we get to 16 exabytes of data in a, uh, in a frame. 
So that's why we don't have to worry about the fin bit and stitching things together. We're just going to put everything in one frame as long as it's available. Uh, you wouldn't want the fin bit if, uh, if you're buffering on the client side, but you want to start the connection and start sending information. So you read that 7-bit length. If it's less than 20, 126, that's the length, and you're done. If it's 126 exactly, read the next 16 bits, and that's the length. If it's 127 exactly, read the next 64 bits, and that's the length. There's a decent amount of logic that goes into just reading the payload length, and we've got to be aware of all this. We, got, we have to be reading the right bytes. If we're reading this 126 and saying the length's 126 and then trying to read the mask, well, that mass that we read was actually the pay, part of the payload length and part of the payload. Uh, we're going, going to get all kinds of jammed up if we're, uh, if we're not following this exactly. So this is one of the first things to implement. Check that length. Or I shouldn't say one of the first things. First, probably first just assume that the length is less than 126 to get things up and running. But this is one of the, the next things that you would want to implement. Yeah. All right, any questions on the length and how you're going to compute that? I, I went fairly slowly in, in detail there so you can start thinking about how you're going to code that using your bit mass and byte arrays. So hopefully everyone did that and we're, we're looking good. Um, all right. Next, if that mass was one, which it's always going to be when we receive from the client, we have to read that mass key. So after whatever happened with the payload length, after we read everything with the payload, the next four bytes is going to be our mask. And we have to read that mask, get those four bytes, and those four bytes are going to be XORed with every, each four bytes of the payload. So we have to read this mask. This mask is going to be random every time. That's the whole point of the mask is to trick the cacher. So this will be a random value. Each message, each frame that the client sends is going to be different. You don't, can't read this just once per client. You have to read this once per frame that you receive. It's always going to be different. So read this masking key and then XOR it with each four bytes of the payload data. So after the masking, uh, the masking key is read, you're finally getting into the actual message that you're receiving. Read the first four bytes of that message, if there are four bytes to read, and then XOR all those bytes with the masking key to start getting back to the actual message that you want to read. This, uh, at that point, those first four bytes after they're XORed with the masking key, those are the first four bytes of your message. You can start putting those in a byte array Keep doing that with each four bytes of the payload. XOR the, these four bytes with the key. XOR the next four bytes with the key until you read the payload length number of bytes. Put all those in a byte array, and now you finally have a message similar to when we receive from a TCP socket and start reading a message and then parsing that information. You finally have the message that you're trying to read, which for our purposes for the homework, this can just be text. This can just be plain text. It can be a message in the chat. Uh, whatever the user typed in, it can just be that encoded as uh, as binary. That's fine. Uh, but that's at that point you're finally reading the message, or it can be JSON, it can be whatever you want, uh, however you want to encode that data. But that's when you're finally getting to the bytes. Uh, and a programming note to keep in mind: if your length payload length is not divisible by four, you're going to have something uneven at the end. So, for example, if your entire payload was only two and you only had two bytes to read, uh, just two bytes to read, you would only XOR those with the first two bytes of your mask uh, and not read the next bytes. So the next two bytes won't exist. So if you have a loop that's saying read four bits and XOR it with the mask until we reach the end of the array, you're going to get that index out of bounds error. You're going to get some errors there uh, because you're trying to read four bytes when there's only two to be read. For, in that example, you would just read the first two bytes and then XOR that with the first two bytes of your mask. So that's how we handle the uneven, uh, the uneven stuff. 
Just a quick reminder on XOR. Now, and this is what the, the client's going to do. If there are four bytes of the message, here's four bytes of a message that client wants to send to us. In binary, they, they're going to generate a, ver a random mask, XOR this with those four bytes, with each four bytes, but they'll XOR that with these four bytes to get this, and this is what's going to go in the payload of, uh, of the frame. This is going to go in the payload. This is going to be the mask. So we have both of these pieces of information when we receive this. And then when we parse all this out, we're going to take this mask and XOR it with this part of the payload again. And now that we have this message XORed with this mask twice, we're going to be back to the original message. So we're doing these bitwise XOR operations. We're doing the same thing that the client did to get back to the original message. And now we can start parsing these bytes and uh, decoding them, doing whatever we need to do with these bytes on the server side. Uh, but this is what's going on. The, the client is going to generate a random key, XOR that with each four bytes of the payload, and then we're going to get that mask, get that XOR payload, and then undemask it by XORing it with that same mask, each four bytes of that same mask. Yeah, I do have a few slides on sending frames. Uh, so we're out of time. So next next time I'll finish up those few slides, and then the rest of the time on Friday we'll go digging in through code and see how all this works in action. See it all playing out. Uh, we'll decode some frames manually. We'll look at the bits and we'll do some live examples with that. So with that I'll see everyone Friday.